Welcome to the Popular Science Lecture Series. Today's lecture is Zeus's Thunderbolt, how one can use light to produce sound, and how it's used in uh, biology and medicine. Dr. Michael Kolios is a professor in the Department of Physics at Ryerson University and Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Studies in the Faculty of Science. His work focuses on the use of ultrasound and optics in the biomedical sciences. Dr. Kolios leads a large group of projects that focuses on optical and ultrasound methods used to characterize tissues and disease, as well as to develop theranostic agents that will assist in both therapeutic and diagnostic applications. Welcome, Dr. Okay, Kolios. Well. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for coming to uh, see this presentation. So uh, I bet you don't know what theranostics means, right? That was mentioned at the beginning, but that's a combination of therapy and diagnosis. So things you could use that will help you in imaging and things that I could use and help you in therapy. However, I'm not going to be talking about that today. I'm going to be talking about uh, Zeus's thunderbolt, I called it, right? How one can use light to produce sound and how that can be used in medicine, okay? So it might not be that obvious, right? What exactly am I getting at? Well, you know, uh, Zeus, the uh, Greek uh, god, uh, used to use thunderbolt, as you can see here, in many of his representations on Greek stamps in, uh, while trying to tackle a lot of his enemies, okay? And if you think about the thunderbolt, right, you hear the thunder, right? But before you hear the thunder, you see the actual lightning, right? So then the question might be, okay, if you see lightning, why do you hear thunder in the first place, right? So if you think about it, right, if I get a laser pointer, which I forgot, unfortunately, my laser pointer, but if I point it at you, you're not going to hear that rumbling noise of thunder. At least you shouldn't. If you do, have a talk with me after the talk. Um, however, right, when you see lightning, you hear the thunder. So what happens in that case, actually, it turns out is that as you have the lightning bolt that traverses through the air, right, you can imagine that the temperature right beside that thunderbolt, do you think it's pretty hot or pretty cold? Hot, right? And we all know that when uh, you have things that heat up, they expand. So what happens is the air column that's right beside the lightning bolt expands. And that expansion is actually what we uh, hear eventually, right, as the sound wave that is produced by the thunderbolt. Sorry, the sound wave that's produced by the lightning bolt. Right? So every time you see lightning, it's not Zeus, uh, you know, trying to tackle some kind of monster like the ancient Greeks used to believe, right? Uh, it is actually the sound that's produced by the absorption of the, light, of the electromagnetic energy that is uh, given by the actual lightning bolt, okay? And uh, of course, you can see many different representations in the Greek mythology of Zeus. They even had it on their uh, coinage, right? That's Zeus here. That's his uh, thunderbolt. Doesn't really look to me that much like one, but I guess, you know, they use their imagination. And uh, if the Greeks, I guess, still have problems with the euro. They might go back to these currencies, so you might see it back again. Anyway, let's think about now medical imaging in general, and then I'm going to try to make that link between uh, this, uh, this thunderbolt and lightning and actual imaging. So this shows, actually, this is an image of the first x-ray uh, made in public, right? And you can see here, again, now no thunderbolt here, just x-rays go through somebody's uh, hand, right? And then if you have a photographic plate underneath, and that's what you see here, right? This is the actual photographic plate, and you could see the bone structure, okay? So that's one of the first examples of medical imaging, and of course, that has created really a revolution in health, okay? Being able to see what happens inside the body, right, uh, helps uh, physicians and doctors in the diagnosis of disease, the staging of disease, etc. So it's had a massive, it has a huge impact to be able to do this kind of medical imaging. And if you ever think to yourselves, well, what would a physicist or engineer have to do with medicine? It's precisely to develop these kind of methods and techniques in order to see things that happen in the body that you could never see before, right, unless you cut it open, okay, don't want to do that. And in order to do things like assess the efficacy of treatments, see how cancers are changing while you're treating patients, etc. So that's generally about medical imaging. So what's another way to make an image not involving x-rays? Okay, if you actually look at a lot of my background before that, before I did this thunderbolt type of research I'm going to be talking about later on, 
I used to do something called ultrasound, right? Now, of course, in ultrasound, what you have is these sound waves, right, that propagate, right? They hit something, and then they come back, and then when you try to listen to how loud it is, so to speak, you can make images of whatever was reflecting the sound in the first place, right? Now, of course, ultrasound is sound that we cannot hear, right? So we can hear up to a certain frequency, right? A certain frequency of sound. That frequency is usually around 20 kilohertz when you're born. And as you age, like myself, right, the maximum frequency that you could actually hear with your ears or detect goes down and down and down and down. In fact, there's this website here. Maybe I shouldn't be showing this, but anyway, ultrasonicringtones.com, where you could download here a particular sound, ringtone sound, so that adults can't hear it, right? <laughs> people that are under 20 typically can hear almost all of these frequencies but people like me probably could not hear it, right? So again, this goes to show you that sound, okay, you have to have a detector that would be able to detect those kind of frequencies. Ultrasound is just sound, just like the sound you're hearing now, that you cannot hear because its frequency is above 20 kilohertz, right? In fact, this is the, one of the only things where, one of the only, I guess, senses we have where I think your best right when you're born, and it goes downhill since, right? Anyway, so uh, what uses ultrasound to navigate its way around things? Well, I guess it's in the title, right? So uh, I'm not going to ask that question, but one in the animal kingdom, you have bats that use ultrasound. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip. Hopefully the clip will have sound so you can hear it. If not, I'm going to try to remember and narrate what it says. And this is from a BBC documentary. The water bat chirps aren't exactly subtle. At 110 decibels, it makes more racket than a road drill. But like us, most of the insects it hunts can't hear ultrasound. As the bat homes in, its squeaks speed up. What happens after is rated R, so I can't show you. No, just kidding. But as you can see here, right, we have an example of an animal in the animal kingdom using ultrasound to navigate through space. And you probably heard those chirp, chirp, chirp. In real life, of course, it's ultrasound, so you cannot hear that, okay? But by using what is called echolocation, sending sound, receiving sound, right, and through some very, very neat signal processing, they could determine how far an object is and how fast it's actually moving. Okay? And that's the basis of, of ultrasound. Okay? Of course, uh, you know, in medical ultrasound, you don't use bats to you know, make noises like that. You use devices. And these are called ultrasound transducers. So ultrasound transducers, which look like this, are just devices that are used to convert an electrical signal to literally just a vibration of a plate. Right? That vibration of the plate is what creates the actual ultrasound. Now, because it's ultrasound, you cannot hear it. So if I took one of these devices here and I stuck it right beside my ear, I wouldn't hear anything, right? And even if you looked very carefully at the surface, those vibrations are on the order of nanometers. So you're about a thousand less than the width of your typical hair, right? So even if you look very carefully, you wouldn't see that actual surface vibrating, okay? So that's what we do in, uh, in clinical ultrasound, right? We do what the bats do to a certain extent, but we use these very clever techniques to actually make an image of whatever it is that scatters the sound in the first place. And of course, one of the major applications that most people would be familiar with in terms of ultrasound, biomedical imaging of ultrasound, is the ultrasound imaging of the fetus. And if you look here, right, uh, can anybody tell me what they think this uh, roundish object is? Head, yeah, that's the head of a baby, okay? Uh, since there's no brain, but I'll explain that a bit later. Anyway, you can see here the rib cage, right? So things that are pretty hard scatter a lot of the sound back and become very bright in the image, so you can see it very clearly. And where you have water or amniotic fluid, to be a bit more exact, do you see much light? No, 
right? That means there's no scattering there. Water doesn't really scatter sound much, right? There's nothing there to make the sound come back, okay? So you can see that you can make images of human anatomy inside the body without using x-rays and without using things that might be a bit more harmful, okay? And uh, you can, by the intensity of that image, because all we're looking at here is intensity, right? How much bright is the signal that comes back, make inferences about the human anatomy. Of, uh, this, uh, of course, I had to take the name off for privacy reasons. It is actually my son. Uh, he's changed quite a bit since then, so I don't think you'd recognize me if you see him on the street based on this. But again, uses of ultrasound. So what I'm going to show you now is the very physical basis by which this happens. This is a schematic. This is an actual experiment, though, right? And what you're going to see is you're going to see these three lines here, right? These three lines, in a sense, are a pressure wave. Okay, a short pressure wave of only about three to four cycles. And you can see the cycles here, right? So I'm going to play this video, and what you're going to see is you're going to see this sound wave, right? Or this pressure wave, to be more exact, traveling through space. And then it's going to hit something, right? And then you're going to see what happens to that wave after it hits it. And I want you to be thinking in ultrasound, that's exactly what happens all the time. We send a wave, a little pulse, just like the one you're going to see here. It travels through space. It hits something and then something comes back and we make images of that. Just like the baby's head. By the way, when I said there wasn't no brain in the baby's head, I can assure you that my son is doing quite well in school, right? But the reason the wave couldn't go through is because of the skull that would bounce a lot of the wave back. So the wave would hit, but not much of it could go through the skull, at least at those frequencies. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens when you have a wave traveling through space. So what do you see how you see this like circle emanating here, right? So what is that? What is happening here? What's happening here is you have what is called scattering of the wave. The wave comes, it hits something, then it comes back. Two things I want you to notice. Uh, the scattered wave or the wave that comes back, so to speak, goes in every direction whatsoever, right? In ultrasound, remember those transducers I showed you that were handheld? You're only intercepting a very, very small portion of the wave, right? So you're holding the transducer, so you're really detecting very little of that energy that comes back up. What actually they do is in some other systems, they have transducers all around the body, right? Like a little um, circle, or a big circle, I guess, so that people could fit in it, right? In which they detect all of, that, all of those waves, and that turns out to be a much more sensitive technique. In fact, uh, a start, well, it's not a startup company anymore, but a company in Detroit has really developed this technology to a very good extent for breast cancer imaging, right? So they have these rings that they scan up and down on the breast and make beautiful ultrasound images, this time by detecting a lot more of the wave and being able to make uh, much more accurate images. Now, I'm not gonna have any equations, I promised, right, that I won't use too many equations, but I have to show some at least, right? It's physics. The thing that determines how this wave scatters and how much of it goes back up and how much of it goes to the side and how much goes under, right? is something called the wave number times the radius of the actual scatter, right? So A is just how big is this, right, the radius, and K is just 2 pi, pi not of the type that you eat, right, the mathematical pi, over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength of the sound inside the medium, okay? So that's what happens. When you're doing ultrasound, you're sending a lot of those kind of things that travel through space in your body, and whenever it hits a bone or whenever it hits something that scatters the sound back, you're basically making images based on that scattered wave that we see here, okay? My, my big question, a lot of my research, which I actually I'm not gonna be talking about today, but just so you know, a lot of my research had to do with, okay, so in, if instead of a aluminum cylinder, I had an actual cancer cell here, right? How does that change the scattering pattern of that cancer cell? So in other words, can I detect that it's a cancer cell just by looking at the scattered wave? And then if that cancer cell is dying because of a treatment or something like that, Right? How would it change that scattered wave? But it was Zeus's thunderbolt talk today, so I'm not going to be talking about that. But I will talk about something quite important, and I do want you to kind of at least generally know about this. What is very important in both photoacoustic imaging that I'll talk about before, but also ultrasound imaging that I'm talking about now, is something called <clears throat> the frequency of the ultrasound. If you notice my uh, son's ultrasound image, that was collected, I think, at around 2 megahertz. I can't remember, right? So 2 megahertz, which means the cycle was 2 million cycles a second, right? Cannot hear that. Now, when you have 1 megahertz, you can penetrate 
this much inside the body. This is here image penetration. It's a log scale. I'm not going to go into that detail now. But you could go very deep at one megahertz. But as soon as you start increasing the frequency of the ultrasound, and this goes from one megahertz here, we go to approximately, I guess, 100 megahertz to one gigahertz here. Look at what happens to how much the ultrasound can penetrate through the body. You see that, especially at one gigahertz, it could go about one micron in the body, one micron, right? That's almost nothing. You can't really do clinical imaging at very high frequencies. But what very high frequencies give you is also very high spatial resolution. So when you go to very high frequencies of sound, right, you could see things that are very, very small. So if it's something that's very small that you want to see, that's not deep in the body, you would definitely try to use what we would call high frequency ultrasound, which is between 20 and 100 megahertz. If you just want to see cells, and we do a lot of work on that, you could go up to gigahertz ultrasound now, where the resolution is on the order of a micron, and cells, right, cells typically around 10 to 20, 30 micron, depending on what kind of cell type you're referring to, okay? So I want you to have that in mind, because up to now, there's no Zeus and there's no Thunderbolt yet, right? I'm only talking about the basics of ultrasound, because as you will see, the type of sound that we produce with what is called photoacoustic imaging is exactly like ultrasound. Okay, there's absolutely no difference. It's just how you make it. So this actually shows you an image of what we call again high frequency ultrasound at 40 megahertz. Now, because you can't penetrate deep in tissues at those frequencies, you have to look at things that are small. So what are some live things that are small? Mice, right? It turns out that one of the most successful ultrasound startups in the world was based in Toronto and their main business was making ultrasound machines to image mice, right? Believe it or not, okay? Well, small animals in general, but the main market was mice because they're used a lot in biomedical research. So here now, if you look at the scale here, this is about uh, <clears throat> one millimeter, so you can see very fine structure, right? You could see here the lymphatics, the node, etc. But if you look at how deep the ultrasound can go, not very deep, about five millimeter, maybe a centimeter, okay? So the higher frequency gives you beautiful images, lots of detail you could see, but very little penetration depth. You can't go very deep. But the one thing those things don't give you, okay, is information about the sound that comes back in terms of its frequency. So I want to get, I'm going to make an extra effort on this point because in photoacoustic imaging it turns out to be important. So these waves here that you saw here, here's a tuning fork. This is almost a perfect sinusoid. Right? So just a sine function or a cosine. Now, if you hear a flute or a clarinet, right, it has many different frequencies. Right? And you can actually analyze these signals and cut it up to see how many frequencies those signals have. And that's what allows you to determine it's a tuning fork, a flute, a clarinet, a, uh, I don't know, what do jazz players play with? Uh, uh, saxophone, etc. cetera. Right? Uh, however, if you look at the amplitude of these waves, they're just as loud. Now, when I'm talking to you, right, you're not only receiving sound waves that come directly to your head, my voice is bouncing all over the walls, right, or the pressure waves, right? And you know it's still my voice because even after the sound bounces off the wall and comes to you, this frequency is almost the same. It's changed a little bit, but not much, right? So, in other words, when you do ultrasound, if you send a one megahertz wave and it hits a bone, the wave that comes back is still around a one megahertz wave, changed just a little bit. Just like my voice when I talk, if it bounces off the wall and it comes back, you can still recognize it's my voice because it has the same frequency content approximately, right? But in photoacoustics, that we'll talk about later, something different happens. So anyway, here are now the harmonics, so to speak, right, of the tuning fork. It only has one frequency. It's one sinusoid with one frequency. Right? When you're looking now at the flute and the clarinet, or the emergency that comes from an actual ambulance that you hear from the outside, it has many different frequencies. Right? And that is shown in this diagram here. However, when you look at this image here, there's nothing about frequencies there. There you're just making a visual representation of the intensity of the sound that comes back. Okay? Okay. So let's go now to Zeus. Okay? Now, remember we talked about lightning a little bit and about hearing something after the lightning. 
Zeus NTO, well, why do I say that in the title? Because this is actually, if you see here, the CN Tower. This is an actual picture of the lightning bolt uh, <clears throat> hitting the CN Tower. Now, I tried to see if I could talk to the Greek gods and see if they were angry or something. You know, maybe the Blue Jays not getting the World Series, or, but you know, they didn't say anything. Anyway, so the big idea again here is the following, right? Light, we know, travels extremely fast, right? So it goes at, you know, how many millions meters per second. So when you see the light, you can consider that as time t equals zero, right? But then you hear the sound after a certain amount of time, right? You could count the number of seconds it took for you to see the light and then hear the sound, and then you could determine approximately how far away the lightning bolt was from you. Why? Because the speed of sound in air turns out to be approximately 350 meters per second, give or take, depending on the temperature, if it's winter, etc. Okay? But let's say 350 meters per second. So after three seconds, approximately, that sound wave has traveled how much? Approximately one kilometer. Right? So if you see a lightning bolt, and after three seconds, did I say hear a lightning bolt? If you see a lightning bolt, and then hear the thunder after three seconds, it's one kilometer away. If you see the lightning bolt, and after six seconds, hear the thunder, it's two kilometers away. If it's zero seconds between the lightning bolt and the thunder, you're toast, right? That's, it hit you or something like that, right? Because light travels much faster than sound. So how can we exploit this for imaging, right? Well, it's that idea. We could use ultrasound to make images that you, that you saw before. And it turns out, if I shine laser light to tissues, it also will produce ultrasound. So therefore now, we could use all these fancy ultrasound machines we have, at least in principle, shine light on the patients, and get ultrasound, and make images. So that is really what photoacoustic imaging is all about. Using light that is absorbed by tissues, that heats it up ever so slightly, that makes it expand, that creates ultrasound, that when then we can use our ultrasound devices to make images of. In fact, this is not new. The fact that light can produce sound is a very old idea. In fact, you, I'm pretty sure you all know who Alexander Graham Bell was. He was one of the first people to actually exploit this effect, right? And if you, and here's actually uh, a, um, a memoriam uh, type of plaque where they basically say here that on the top floor of this building was sent on June 3rd, 1880. I assume none of you were born by then. Over a beam of light to 1325 something street, the first wireless telephone message in the history of the world, right? So he actually, he used light and because he modulated that light that hit a little sap substance that would then start, you know, expanding and contracting, right, to actually create the first wireless message way before we had the iPhones and all this other stuff that we had. In fact, that is him in a schematic representation of that event, and he considers it his greatest achievement ever. However, that technology had, was never used for biomedical applications, okay? So you can use light. So let's see how you would use it for biomedical applications. So I'm giving you just a schematic example here, right? You can imagine that you have a pulsed laser source, so we need to create that lightning, so to speak, right? And the way we're going to create that lightning is with lasers, okay? So you shine a laser, right? You shine it on tissue, and what happens, something absorbs that light. What? I'll tell you later on, so you'll have to wait. Something absorbs that light. When that something that absorbs the light, that energy gets converted to heat that makes it expand ever so slightly but very fast, right? That creates then ultrasound waves that travel all through space, just like the scattered sound that we saw from the aluminum, right? But here, there's nothing traveling there, just light that illuminates everything, gets absorbed, creates the ultrasound, and then you could use your ultrasound transducer, right? The same transducer you were using before to detect that sound and make an image. And this represents an image of whatever it was here that was absorbing the light, okay? So, some examples, and again, these are kind of gee whiz to show you the types of applications that you can see now, and I find extremely exciting. Most of these 
developed in the last five years. So this is a very new technology that has not had yet clinical impact because they're still developing the technology, but in my opinion will have clinical impact, is the detection of tumors and their vasculature. This is a tumor in the back of a mouse. It's a melanoma. And with photoacoustic imaging, they can get these beautiful images, not only of the tumor and its spatial extent, but also of the blood vessels that surround the tumor. And of course, this is actually a very old image. This was probably in the early 2000s, I think, that they created this. But it's amazing that they could create these exquisite images with great detail of the vasculature, because it turns out that tumors need a lot of energy to grow, right? They're rapidly dividing cells, and they, through a process called angiogenesis, recruit the vasculature around them, right? And when they do that, photoacoustic imaging is very sensitive to that. Now, another really neat application is the following. They can actually look in the brain of a mouse and make, again, fancy images of the vessels. These are all blood vessels, okay? At very, very small scales. This scale here, if you could see it, that's 40 micrometers, right? That's about, again, half the width of your hair. So really, really small. You can see the blood vessels here, but they have these very odd colors for them. Why would they have these very odd colors superimposed on this image? Well, it's because they get something called the oxygen saturation of the blood. And that's a very critical parameter, it turns out, for many different type of physiological diseases, etc. So here now, what they do is, they have a mouse, they're looking at its brain, they're looking at a small part of the brain, and then they're doing electric hint paw stimulation, right? So they're just stimulating, right, its paw. What happens is you would expect that certain areas of the brain that are related to that area will get activated. And indeed, if I play this video, you will see, and if it works, okay, some videos worked, some didn't. However, if you were to see the video, the before and after is shown here. You could see that this vessel, that before the actual stimulation, right, was not well oxygenated because all the oxygen, it was not well oxygenated, then becomes oxygenated when the neurons are recruited to do whatever function they have to do, okay? So not only can they make images like ultrasound, but through a process I'm gonna explain in the next few slides, they could tell you about the oxygenation status, right, of blood. But why and how? Because it turns out that in terms of contrast, now contrast is a very important parameter in imaging, right? You can have a good resolution, you could see things that are extremely small, but if it's a green thing on a green background, could you see it? No, you need the contrast, right? So if you ask the question, what is the main source of contrast in photoacoustic imaging? So in other words, if I shine light on you, what absorbs the majority of that light? What would you think it is? Sorry? No? Melanocytes, number one, right? Melanin that is produced, that's why when we get out in the sun, all of a sudden, our skin becomes darker to protect the nucleus in the cells, right? So melanocytes absorb a lot of light, but that's only typically on the surface of the skin, right? What's inside the body that would absorb a lot of light? Well, if you look at the previous image, it was an image of what? Blood vessels. So it turns out that the main source of contrast, the thing that absorbs a lot of light in photoacoustic imaging, is this thing here and I'm sure you can all recognize it. No? Nobody can recognize it? Well, of course, it's a schematic, it's a statue, so to speak. And uh, actually, it is the hemoglobin molecule in a red blood cell, okay? Now, of course, I didn't expect you to recognize that, obviously, but anyway, so it turns out that these, the hemoglobin molecule inside the red blood cells absorbs a lot of light. Not only that, but is really cool is this. If that hemoglobin molecule is oxygenated or deoxygenated, it absorbs the light differently. That's why in the previous image of the brain of the mouse, they were able to not only make the image of the vessels, but to say in that vessel, right, what the oxygen saturation was, how much oxygen, right, was on the red blood cells in that blood vessel. And that is what is making this technique so exciting. Because all of a sudden now, instead of just seeing a static image, now you could start using different optical wavelengths 
and being able now to see things you really couldn't see before with this kind of resolution. Okay? So here's the hemoglobin molecule. Again, when oxygen binds to it, it absorbs the light differently. It's like little antennas almost, right? That kind of like absorb all the light and that, that creates heat, that creates then the expansion, that creates the ultrasound that you just hear. Okay? So, now the thing is, remember, I said that if I'm talking and the sound hits the wall and it comes back to me, the frequency of that sound doesn't change that much. So if I was able to sing at one megahertz, which I can't, of course, I wish I could, then I could be my own ultrasound scanner, I guess. Anyway, if I shoot a wave of one megahertz and it bounces off the wall, it's going to be around one megahertz that comes. But if I shine light on tissues, what is the frequency of the sound that will be produced? And in fact, it was this very basic scientific question that was torturing me for actually several years that led to a lot of the research that we do. So in other words, what determines the frequency of the sound, the ultrasound, that is produced when you shine light on tissues? And of course, to answer something like that, ah, okay, I, I inserted a couple of more slides. Let's just go first to, hmm, okay. Now, propagation of light through tissue, okay? So, I'm shining the light. You could see here in one example, if I shine light, laser light, through water, right? What happens to that light? It just goes like a straight line almost, right? It just goes straight through. Now, that's because the water doesn't have things that scatter the light. Remember that uh, aluminum? thing I had in the middle and the waves just being scattered all over, right? That doesn't happen with light and just water. The light just pretty much goes through. However, if I add water and a little milk, look at what happens to the light. It scatters. It goes a little bit more. And then in fact, if you have total milk, right, it just diffuses. It scatters all over the place. So our cells, our tissues, is it more like water? Or is it more like milk when it comes to light scattering? Milk, yeah. So if I took a, and unfortunately I forgot my laser pointer, it's a really cool demo I have, but if I took a laser pointer and I shine it on my light, it just scatters everywhere. My whole finger lights up and becomes red when I do that, okay? So even though we're mostly water, when it comes to scattering, of light at least, right, we're mostly like milk. In fact, there was a Star Trek episode now anyway, so if I see, if I put a little absorber here, right, something that absorbs that light, okay, here I would get no photoacoustic signal, right? Why? Because that absorbing structure is not exposed to any light. The light is just beside it, right? But here I will get a signal, right? So it's very critical when you're doing these kind of analyses to know how does the light go all over the tissue in order to interpret the images that you actually get. A little bit technical, but anyway, now you know that you're more like milk. Now, the thing that determines how strong that signal is is something called the absorption coefficient, okay? Optical absorption coefficient. And this is wavelength of the light. What kind of wavelengths can we see? Can anybody remind me, typically? Nobody? Visible light. Sorry, visible light. And what wavelengths approximately would the visible light be? Approximately? 700, yeah, yeah. So this is the optical window right here. I mean, you can see light here, 400 to 800. Now, it turns out that when you look at these curves, this shows you how much the absorption coefficient is for the hemoglobin species. Now, look at this. If I were to choose, let's say, seven, well, there it is, 600 and uh, something, right? You see that the blue, which says HB, right, which is deoxygenated hemoglobin, absorbs a certain amount. The red thing, sorry, the red line, absorbs quite a bit less at that wavelength, right? And don't forget, right, this is a log scale, and the difference here is about a factor of 100, right? Those are very big differences. If I said I'd increase your salary by a factor of 100, I'm sure you'd be pretty happy, right? So these are very big differences. But then if you choose this other wavelength now, right, all of a sudden, the oxygenated hemoglobin that absorbed much less, now absorbs more. The deoxygenated, hemoglobin, the deoxygenated hemoglobin that used to absorb much more at this wavelength absorbs less. And that's exactly what they do in principle 
to measure the oxygenation of blood and tissue. They shine at two different laser wavelengths. They compare the intensity of the signals they get. And if the intensity changes, just like these two change, they could determine how oxygenated is the hemoglobin, right? And therefore, the oxygen saturation of blood. Okay? They call this area here the optical window, not because there's actual windows, right? But because light can actually penetrate quite a bit through tissues at those wavelengths. If I tried to do the same with UV light, and I tried to penetrate, it would penetrate very, very little, right? It gets absorbed all in the first few hundred microns of the skin. So that's why even what laser light you use is very important in the application in photoacoustics. And you can get these like astounding images. This shows you the, I think it's the ear lobe of a rat, okay? Right here. And you'll say, well, that doesn't look like an ear lobe. Yeah, it does a bit, right? Curvature here. It has blood vessels, many blood vessels. And again, look at the colors. The impressive thing is not just that you could see these vessels, but you could make these color maps that show the oxygen saturation of the blood, right? So it's not just an anatomical anymore imaging modality. You're getting actually what is called functional imaging information by using photoacoustics. Of course, I'm not going to go through all the engineering. There's a lot of engineering, right? that goes into how do you make these type of images, but the basic principle still is you use light to produce sound that allows you now to make these exquisite images of the vasculature and also the oxygenation states. Okay? But can you hear the light? No, you can't hear the light, but if you had a device that could detect the ultrasound waves, you could. So again, going back to that initial question I had, what is the frequency of these photoacoustic waves that is produced? As I said, in ultrasound, you send a one megahertz wave. What comes back is one megahertz predominantly. In light, you send a nanosecond pulse. So these are actually very short pulses. The reason is technical, so I'm not going to mention it. But you send very short pulses. And the question is, what determines the frequency of the sound that comes back? And the obvious answer is a bursting balloon. I know, I see confused faces. I was confused too initially. It's not obvious. So now, interestingly enough, this goes to show you basic science too. There was this uh, group of scientists in the 60s that wanted to figure out what is the sound, the frequency, and the sound produced by bursting balloons. So they conducted these very long, rigorous experiments where they would just take a pin, right, fill a balloon with water, and burst it. And then they had this very sensitive microphone, right, to actually detect the sound that is produced. Now it's kind of interesting, when I was first talking about this in another presentation, I kind of make fun of those experiments. And then it turned out one person in the audience was the person that actually participated in the experiments. And I said, oops, so always be careful. Anyway, so what happens here? It turns out, and this is a scientific paper, and its title is N waves from bursting balloons. Okay. An actual paper, so the scientific study it was published in 1968, May of 1968, right, by people at Rochester in the Acoustical Physics Laboratory, and they recorded the sound, and the sound wave, instead of being this nice uh, sinusoid that I was talking about before, was this thing that looked like this, N, right? It was an N wave, that's why they call it obviously an N wave, its shape is a bit like an N, okay? And they did these very rigorous experiments trying to understand why did you get these kind of end shapes. They say for some reason the color of balloons was an, also an important factor. I have no idea why really, right? That's why I made fun of the article initially. But they found that a statistically significant difference between red and uh, yellow balloons or whatever it was. Anyway, not that relevant. So we can do the same thing, right? And actually do an experiment in photoacoustics and try, instead of bursting a balloon, shining light on this thing here. Now, remember, um, let me just say it again. I'm not going to spend too much time. There was an episode of Star Trek. Now, you're very young, so maybe a lot of you don't even know what Star Trek is. But anyway, it's a science fiction uh, series. Okay? And uh, there were this Captain Kirk. Actually, in this case, it was Jean-Luc Picard. It was another version of the series anyway. Uh, he would go to space, and he'd meet these aliens. Right? And the first time the aliens saw the humans, of course, conveniently, there was this universal translator. Now, how does that exactly work? How can you translate a language of a species you met for the first time? Anyway, not going to go to that. But 
The first thing the alien said was, you ugly bags of mostly water. Right? So the ugly is subjective. Right? The aliens obviously didn't like the way we looked. But the mostly water is actually true. Right? So if you look at the composition of the body, we're approximately 70%, 60%, whatever it might be, water. So therefore, when we try to make materials that emulate the body, many times we use gels. And gels have a lot of water. Right? So this is a gel. And we put a big black thing right in the middle to make sure it absorbs all of the light. Okay? And you can see the scale here is around 10 millimeters, one centimeter, right? So one centimeter approximately ball. And we shine the light, we put a microphone right beside it, or a transducer, remember, right? These are ultrasound waves. And lo and behold, there's the N wave, not a perfect N, right? Things don't always work perfectly in experiments as they do in theory, but that's N-ish enough, I think, right, for my taste, okay? In fact, the really cool thing about this is the following that if you know what the speed of sound through this is, and just by looking at the time distance between these two peaks, what is it approximately here? Eh, I don't know, four microseconds, something like that. Five microseconds. Speed of sound in this gel is approximately 1.5 um, millimeters per microsecond. You multiply it by five and you almost get 10 millimeters, right? So just by looking at the distance between the peaks, you can deduce what the size of the object that produced that wave actually is. And there's the key. If you look at this here, this distance in time, this is time, right? But it's also related to frequency, okay? So the frequency of the photoacoustic waves that are produced are intimately related to the size of whatever is producing that photoacoustic wave. So if you have really, 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 really small things producing photoacoustic waves, this distance here becomes really, 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 really small. Oops. And if it's really small, the frequencies are very high, right? If it's really big, right, the N wave, the distance is big. It's a long sine wave, right? The frequency is low. So it's the size of whatever absorbs the light that determines the frequency of the wave that we actually detect. Okay? Now this is one of my favorite formulas. CFL, Canadian Football League, that's what I call it, right? The speed of sound, C, is equal to frequency times the wavelength, right? Of course, this is not an L, it's a Greek lambda, but close enough, right? Always remember that for traveling waves. Now, I said I wanted to image small things like cells, right? But cells are not a centimeter in size, right? Cells are things that are more like one micron in size. Not one micron, we said that around 10 to 30 micron, depending on what kind of cell, etc. Then if you try to draw an N wave that corresponds to something that small, what you see is that in order to detect it efficiently, you need gigahertz detecting devices. I can't even hear megahertz, let alone gigahertz, right? So we have to have very specialized equipment in order to detect the photoacoustic waves that are produced by very, very small things. And in fact, that's what we do. So I'm going to skip this for now. Key points, the size determines the frequency. And, the, and it turns out that, actually I'm not going to skip this point, I shouldn't have. This dotted line is an N wave. This red line is a distorted N wave. Why is it distorted? Because a transducer, the thing that detects the sound, cannot detect all of the frequencies that, of the sound that hits it because it's not sensitive enough. Just like our ears, remember I said that we can only hear about up to 20 kilohertz? Ultrasound transducers, just like our ears, can only detect a certain frequency range of sound. So what happens is, in many experiments at these high frequencies, instead of giving this perfect N, we don't get the N anymore. We get these kind of curves that look like the red curve. But it is correct once you take into account the sensitivity range of your detecting device. Okay? Just like the example with the ultrasound ringtones Dot com. Now, I don't encourage you to do that, by the way, right? Okay. So, how do we make this device? Here's the, what is called the photoacoustic scanning acoustic microscope. And all it really is, is an optical microscope. Here's the optical objective, where <clears throat> we took the part, the objective from the top, and we replaced it by something that will listen to the sound, the transducer. Okay? So, we shine light through the microscope, it hits whatever it hits, and then our transducer 
detects or listens to that sound. So we can now look at very, very small objects and try to see those gigahertz waves we were kind of thinking or imagining about. Can you actually detect them? Okay. This is what it actually looks like. So you're under the microscope now. You're looking at your cells. These are cancer cells in clusters. Okay. Some of them round and unhappy. Some of them just lying and stretching a little bit happier. Okay. And this kind of circle you see in the background, that's the speaker, the detector, so to speak. That's actually the ultrasound transducer. It's far in the background and you can just see the shade of it, right? But right in the middle here is what is called the focus of the transducer. So when we shine light on this, our transducer here will detect the photoacoustic waves produced by whatever we put in there. So if you put a cell, we'll detect the actual sound that is produced by the light that hits the cell. If you put a red blood cell, we hear the sound that a red blood cell emits when it's exposed to light. So that's how we do the experiment. We shine light from underneath, there's a cell or an object, and then we listen. Okay? Again, remember that now that we shine the light, sound goes in every direction. We're only intercepting a very small portion of that spherical wave that emanates all over space. Okay, so what can we do? Well, this is actually an image of a melanocyte. Okay, remember we said there are certain cells on your skin that produce melanin to protect you from UV light? This is an actual melanocyte, and this is a photoacoustic signal from that melanocyte. Now look at how it lights up. So the entire cytoplasm of that particular melanin cell has a very strong photoacoustic signal, as one might expect, because the melanin absorbs all the light and therefore creates the sound. But if you look at the nucleus, it's a bit like a black hole, not of the astronomical variety, of course, right? It just means here that you're not absorbing light. And that's because melanin is not really in the nucleus of the cell, right? So only where you had the melanin are you detecting it. And then as you increase the frequency, you could see crisper detail, right? Remember I was talking about ultrasound resolution and how at higher frequencies you could get better resolution? The same thing happens with photoacoustics, okay? Now, how about blood? This is an actual red blood cell under the microscope, and this is a photoacoustic image of a single red blood cell. Okay? Hard for you to appreciate, but the, what is called signal to noise here is huge. In fact, pursue your crazy ideas with rigor and with passion. Why do I say that? Uh, when I first purchased this device, it was an acoustic microscope, nothing about photoacoustics. And it was very expensive. Very, very expensive. So I wanted, I got these ideas, I did some Bach at the envelope calculations, I said maybe we could make this into a photoacoustic imaging device if we use light. Now, I didn't make this device, I'm not at that level of engineering, but there's a company, not a company, an organization in Germany called the Fraunhofer Institute that does amazing engineering work. They made the acoustic microscope for me, they sold it, I was a very happy customer. And then when I asked them, can I convert this into a photoacoustic microscope, they gave me a pretty expensive, again, expensive uh, quote. And then they said, oh, it's not going to work. These ideas are very crazy. It's not going to work. And of course, when they say it with that kind of accent, it's like a dagger almost, right? You know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work, right? I didn't have the money. So I had to go to my dean and uh, you know, beg and plead and say, yeah, you have this really good idea, please, you know, let's try to make it work. I showed him my calculation, etc. right? And then he says, okay, very interesting. So what did the makers of the device think about this idea? I said, hmm, okay, so I had to explain everything, but anyway, he took the chance and it worked beautifully for us, right? So again, with rigor, pursue your crazy ideas, especially when you're younger. Anyway, here's the actual signal. So we take now one RF line, remember the uh, sine waves we're talking about? This is at this one location, this one pixel, that's what the line looks like. And now this is the frequency of the waves that are produced. Notice, 500 megahertz to 1500 megahertz. These are extremely high frequencies that we're detecting here. Because of the attenuation is so high, that's why the Germans told me there's no way you're going to be able right, to detect the signal. But again, there are just so many hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell that absorbs the light, right? that you're still able, despite the fact that so much of the sound gets attenuated, that you could detect it. Okay, and you can see now, start thinking things like this, like these dips. What are these dips? Why are they there? Again, you look at the N shape of balloons, and you could actually predict exactly 
where those dips in the frequency occur. So for some frequencies, they don't produce a lot of sound, right? At this frequency here, they don't produce a lot of sound. At this frequency here, they produce a lot of sound. Okay? So these are measurements from red blood cells. Of course, this is the work of my many staff and graduate students. This is literally the blood of one of my graduate students, who was a graduate student, actually he's a postdoctoral fellow and in the audience. I won't disclose who it is. Um, the sweat and blood of my graduate students. Anyway, so here now we did photoacoustic imaging of these single red blood cells, and what was really neat is this. We put this in a medium, and it was kind of like a viscous medium, so the cell was kind of, and I hope the video works, but anyway, the cell was kind of uh, horizontal, oh sorry, vertical, going down, and then when it would hit the slide, it would slowly rotate. And if you look at the end balloon theory, it predicted that the frequency of the sound produced when it's like this versus when it's like this should be very different, okay? And if this video works, you will see this is the sound produced by a single red blood cell. And look at how it changes as this red blood cell is rotating in space. It's exactly what the theory predicts, right? The shape of the red blood cell in other words, the light, the way it's exposed to the light, changes the frequency content of that cell, just like the theory predicted. And we could do many different things to probe what is called red blood cell morphology, but I'm not going to talk about that, but you could change its shapes. You can make the red blood cell look like a porcupine. You can make it look like many different things. And it totally changes the photoacoustic signal amplitude. But here's where I think, and uh, I'll be finishing rather soon, here's where I think some of the very exciting applications are. Okay, Now, what am I showing you here? It's kind of complicated, but I have many panels. In the very top, this is a US, not the country, this is an ultrasound image of a tumor of a mouse. And where you see this delineation is the actual tumor. Okay, So the tumor is this thing here. This is the skin on the top. Now, then we treat this tumor. And we want to see what happens to the tumor after we treat it? Well, two hours after the treatment, if we look at the ultrasound, I guess I can ask the question, can you see the difference? Nah, I can't see the difference. Can you see the difference? It's very subtle. I mean, there are small differences, but it's rather subtle. Okay? Now, let's do the same thing by shining light. So we're shining light now. We're shining light at 750 nanometers, 750, and 850, 850. Why two? You'll see in a bit. So this is the photoacoustic image at 750. This is the photoacoustic image at 750 after the treatment, two hours after the treatment. Now here you can actually, again, if you squint hard enough, you could probably see a difference, right? If you squint hard enough. And these are the images at 850. So you know what, Professor Colios? Doesn't look exciting, right? I could see nothing really has happened there. Until now, you start doing that ratio we were talking about before to see whether the blood that produces that signal is oxygenated or not. And then what you see is an image that looks like this. Before the treatment, this cancer, this tumor, had blood that was well oxygenated. 30 minutes after the treatment, all of a sudden now, right, you don't have that signal anymore the actual tumor, at least the vasculature of this tumor, responded to the actual treatment. And of course, we're following up these mice over a very long term after to see if we actually cure the cancer. And there seems to be, and fingers crossed, right, a very good correspondence between whether the vasculature for this treatment, whether the vasculature of the tumor is responding to the treatment, 30 minutes even after we start the treatment, and the eventual outcome. Are you able to actually get rid of the cancer after the entire treatment, right? And these are histograms. I'm not really going to talk about that much. And the last thing I'm going to say, and I plug also for the St. Michael's Hospital, because there's an institute here called the iBEST, and it literally has some of the best instrumentation in the world, and this is not an exaggeration, when it comes to photoacoustic imaging, okay? They recently purchased something called the NSOT, right? Kind of looks like a toaster that's really big, but it really isn't. Anyway. This is a photoacoustic imaging device. This, instead of using one transducer that you hold in your hand that I was talking about before, uses the ring approach, where it has 256 of them in a circle, all listening to the sound produced by light. 
And you could do some e extremely cool stuff with that because now you can introduce chromophores of your interest into the animal. GFP, for some of you that might know what that is, green fluorescent protein, other things that absorb light. And now you could localize it exactly as to where it is in tissue by doing this kind of spectral approach. In other words, use many different optical wavelengths, see how does the photoacoustic signal change for those optical wavelengths, and if it matches the absorbing structure you know of, then that absorbing structure is actually there. And this shows you in this example how in this photoacoustic image, which really doesn't look that cool or sexy, you don't see a lot of anatomy, you don't see a lot of detail, but you see what counts and you see that in this case, the protein is being expressed at that location in space, right? That is very, very hard to do with other imaging modalities. Limitations. Of course, IG whiz you with a lot of the neat things you could do with this kind of technology, but light has to get there, right? And many times it's very difficult to get light to penetrate through tissue at the depths you want. So if there's one limitation of this modality, and one of the things the engineers are working 24-7 to try to solve is how do we get light deep inside your body? It doesn't have to be a lot of light, but enough light to give you a photoacoustic signal that we can detect. The other thing is to get very detailed images, you have to detect waves, again, that are very high frequency. And if those are produced deep in the body, they're not going to be able to get to the surface. Okay? And finally, those lasers I told you about, right? They cost about $80,000, right? Uh, not pocket change. So it's a very expensive technology at this point. Plus, these lasers, unfortunately, are very finicky. So, you know, if a graduate student accidentally <coughs> bumps into the laser, I get very angry. I become Zeus and I'm looking for the actual lightning bolt, right? Because then you have to realign all the mirrors and all the other different engineering parts of that. Now, if you want more information on this, uh, clearly, the world leader is Dr. Lee Han Wang, who used to be at actually Washington, now he's going to Caltech. Beautiful images, talks a lot about the technology, and is big in outreach. So he has beautiful videos that talk about the development of this technology, how he's using it in small animal imaging, and some of the clinical applications. So I might have said there are no clinical applications, but it is being used on humans on a trial basis, right? It's just that if you go to a normal hospital, right, that's not doing research, right, a community hospital, you'll never see a photoacoustic device. But many research hospitals now, because of the capabilities of photoacoustics to do what I just said, are uh, adopting this technology. You could also do a Google search on Coleus publications, and you'll find many things associated with this. Uh, uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge the photoacoustic group in my laboratory, and also many of the different funding agencies that make a huge difference, right? If it wasn't for the funding agencies that provide us the resources to do all of this crazy sounding work, right? Like imagine if I'm trying a, writing a grant and I say I want to become like Zeus and throw lightning bolts and make sound that I will detect, right? You know, anyway, we don't say it that way, of course. Uh, you know, very big thanks to all the agencies that have contributed. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you.